Hi guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to Introduction to Rust. So this would be the second video in this series. In the last video, we talked about setting up Rust and we talked about primitive types. In this video, we'll go a little bit more deep into primitive types and we'll talk about some of the more peculiar things, particularly about tuples and arrays. So we didn't really talk about this before, but we can actually put a tuple inside of a tuple. You can see here that we have a tuple called T, which has one A and false in it. And then we have a tuple called F, which has two and T in it. So quite literally, if we were to copy T and just paste it here, these would be equivalent to how they were before. So it actually takes T and inserts it here. And we can also print out things from T. So for instance, if we call our println macro here, and we put in curly braces into the string. Then we can call t.01 or t.0, which we'll call one, and it will put it inside of the string. We can put more curly braces here, and we can say t.1, this will put a in, and then we could put another set of curly braces and put t.2 in here. Running the program will predictably print out one a and false. However, something interesting happens if we try to print out f.1. Now the problem with trying to print out f.1 is that it's trying to print out the entire tuple here. And you'll see here that it's throwing an error. It's basically saying that this tuple doesn't have the display trait. Now traits are something that we'll get to a bit later in this tutorial, but uh, suffice to say, the compiler just doesn't know how to print out a tuple properly. If we do want to print out the tuple, we can put a colon and a question mark in here, and you can see that the error goes away. So if we run this, you can see here that the first print line statement prints out one A and then false, and then the second one prints out the actual tuple with the uh, parentheses around it. And in fact, even if we just call F, which is a tuple with a tuple inside of it, it prints out both sets of parentheses as well as, you know, how the tuple actually looks inside of our code. So this colon question mark here is what's called a debug flag. And since our tuples have a debug trait built into them, we can actually do it this way. Now, if we want things to be a little bit more pretty, we can actually put a uh, pound sign inside of the uh, colon and the question mark. And you'll see here that it actually gives us new lines for each portion. So we have a parenthesis, then a new line, two comma, new line, parenthesis, etc. And this is actually just a little bit more idiomatic to the Rust code that it's mirroring. Essentially, you can think of this as a pretty debug flag. Now, despite the fact that we could have printed out the other tuple, if we have a tuple that's too long, it actually won't work. Now you see here, it's saying the trait bound to, and then it has all of the uh, types inside of this particular tuple listed is not satisfied. So we're kind of getting the error that we were getting before when we just had the display like this. But basically what's happening is it's just the compiler just doesn't know how to deal with this many values here in the debug. So we'd have to implement this manually. And that's something again that we'll get to later. All right, so now let's talk about arrays. As you can see here, we can actually give arrays a type signature. In this case, we're saying that this array is filled with i32 integers and it's of length five. And you can see here that we have five values in here, each one of type i32. As mentioned before, we can access the values inside of an array. And so we can do that inside of our println macro as well. You can see here that we're using square brackets and we're saying that we want the zeroth index, which would be the four. So this will take four and it will put it inside of the string here. We can also access the array's length. So for instance, if I type in xs.lang, this will actually give us the length, which is five, and it will print it out here. So I can also bring in a library. I'm not going to really talk about how this is working right yet, but I'm bringing in this library that's allowing us to run this function. And what this function is doing is it's going to tell us how big this array is inside of memory. So let's run this now. And you can see here that we get a four and then five. So four is the index zero element of that array. Five is the length of the array. And then 20 is the actual size in memory. So it's 20 bytes in size. So say we just want a few elements from this array. 
we can actually then take a slice of the array. And the way you take a slice of an array is you put an AND sign here, and this stands for reference, something that we'll talk about extensively later. And we're referencing XS in this case. So we want the second index, which is 0, 1, 2, which is 6, up to the fourth index. So we want 6 and 7. This doesn't actually go to fourth index, so it won't actually include 8 in it. It'll just include the two values, 6 and 7. And we can see this by actually printing it out. You can see here it prints out 6 and 7. And we can actually print out the values inside of this array by printing them out here. So we say 0 and 1. And if we were to take, for instance, and put 2 in here, this will then give us an error when we actually run the code. And you can see here the len is 2, but the index 2. So it's saying that it doesn't exist inside of this array. Now we can use our debug flags to actually print out arrays and slices. So in this case, we want to print out our slice first, and then we want to print out our array. And you'll see here that it will print it out with the square brackets. So this one will say 6, 7, and this other one will say 4 through 8. All right, so before we close out this tutorial, let's talk about something that's kind of important. So if I write let s equal string, you'd think that this is actually a string, when in reality this is what's called a slice of a string. And so like with our arrays before, we're actually just taking a part of a string and we're assigning to s. And you can see here that when I hover over it, we actually get an and sign and then we get this str type. Now if I create another variable called ss and I use this string and then from function, and then I pass in a string here, this will actually come back as a string type. So there's actually a difference between just using double quotes to create a string in Rust and actually using a function to create a string in Rust because strings are not technically literal types in Rust. Instead, strings are more like arrays or tuples in the sense that they're compound types. So in this sense, they are compound versions of slices of strings put together to become strings or rather they are compound types that are made up of multiple different characters. So we can even demonstrate this by taking our string here, or rather our slice of string, and using the toString method to actually convert it to a string. And you can see now it says std string string. So the type is now a string. So this is fairly important and something that will come into play a bit later when we actually talk about uh, some of the more inter some of the more complex parts of Rust. So we can take a slice of our string by using the same syntax that we used to take a slice of our array. So we say reference ss 0 to 4 and this will take 1, 2, 3, 4. This will take uh, these uh, letters and put them inside of this variable here. And we can show that by printing it out to the screen. You can see here that it prints out STRI. So we can also concatenate strings. Uh, as you can see here, I've created two strings. One is hello, comma, and then a space. And then the other one is world with a, an exclamation point at the end. And then I say here, let S equal H plus, and then a reference to W. Now the reason why we use a reference to W uh, is a little bit abstract, and it's something that we will go into later. Uh, suffice to say that the trait for the uh, plus operator, the quote-unquote concatenation operator here, uh, sort of takes in, like the function itself, takes in a itself, and then it takes in a like reference to string. So it looks something like this. Uh, I know that's not going to mean much to you right now, but... Uh, it'll make more sense later. So let's print out S. So S we've put in here. And you can see here we get our hello world as expected. Oh, and one more thing before I close out. I just thought I'd mention that, for instance, you can actually create a tuple that's completely empty. So if we just say let T equal an empty tuple, so just empty parentheses, this is what's called a unit value. So our main function, for instance, actually returns an empty tuple. So functions that don't return anything technically return empty tuples. And you can see here, if I hover over main, it says fm, 
and it shows empty parentheses and then there's an error to empty parentheses. So in essence, any function that doesn't return anything actually returns an empty tuple. This is just kind of a thing that you might want to know. It's not really that big of a deal uh, and it doesn't really have too many ramifications on anything. I mean, there are a few uh, instances where it's important. Alright guys, so I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope it wasn't too abstract, especially when we started talking about strings. Hopefully things are sort of going at a fairly simple pace here. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to like and comment. If you have any questions or comments, of course, feel free to comment. And if you disliked it, then by all means downvote it as much as you'd like. Have a good night.